All right. Hi, I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I'm doing a series of webinars during the pandemic. Uh, I started to just, because I wanted to chat with my friends and have something to do and learn something along the way, because my motto for teaching was safe, fun, and educational. Well, webinars certainly are safe. There's not a problem there about any great risk. Uh, fun and educational, those are the other two prongs. And being able to talk with people that I wouldn't normally have time for. Um, that's one thing about being home, I've been home since March now, is that uh, so many of us are so busy in our lives and traveling that we you know, know about each other, but we're like ships passing in the night and don't really get a chance to chat. So the webinars have given me a, an incredible opportunity to talk to uh, experts and professionals all around the world. Um, and tomorrow my guest is Bob Bowker, that's gonna be at four o'clock. Um, and he's coming back for his third time. We're really hoping that his internet connection holds. Um, I already have his presentation, so that's good. Didn't have it last time. Um, but it's such an, an amazing medium to be able to share this knowledge with you and share my guests with you. Today, my guest is Emma Loftus from Australia, which is why we're broadcasting at seven o'clock tonight. It's what time? 10 o'clock for you in the morning? It is 10 o'clock. <laughs> Um, and Emma has uh, been working with racehorses. So I'm going to let her introduce herself so you get to know her, and then we'll get on with the topic. So welcome, Emma. I'm so excited to talk to you because we got a little preview last night. We had so much fun. <laughs> we did. Thank you so much, Wendy, for having me on the webinar series. And uh, I just want to shout out to Joe Watman, who... Who should be on, away. I hope. <laughs> yes. And of course, Sinead McCann, who's been like part of a big support crew in New South Wales. <laughs> Yeah. behind me here um yeah I'm, i was sad that bob bowker's uh webinar was postponed because i was i was so keen to listen to what he had to say and if there was any i could you know had any questions which i know i would have but i'll watch it tomorrow for sure yeah um he, he's a, guess, a fascinating speaker because he his mind yeah. runs so fast he goes da, 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 and you're supposed to know what that means <laughs> <laughs> you have to unpack him a little sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I actually um, met him early. It was at a Sharon May Davis dissection uh, a few years ago. He turned up to do a, a talk for the, um, the students of the Podiatherapy College, the College of Podiatherapy. And he rocked up a bit jet lagged and sort of I've sidled over to him. And he's talking about racehorses, concussion, and and then he's dissecting a leg about half an hour later and there's about 12 of us kind of huddled around him and next thing you know we're in the lecture room and he's just talking at us with a foot and yeah it was amazing yeah he's it was, uh, showed I was up very in lucky clinic one time and he had he had boiled down all his feet so he had these mixoid you know they look like marshmallows from the frog oh. you know and he was like you know, showing, wow he's really a cool guy so it's Emma, fascinating because he Yes. Oh, go ahead. Because uh, we could talk no, about no. that forever. But but how we about could. you? Like how did how did, when did you get started with horses and how did you wind up with racehorses? Well, uh, I was first introduced to horses when I was very little, when I was like six. Um, and I'm the only horsey person in my family. My sisters had to go, but they weren't interested. But it was actually when I was at maybe about 15 years old in school. I, I don't know if you've heard of Walter Farley and the Black Stallion. Oh, of course. <laughs> well, that's, <clears throat> I was hooked. I was hooked. And I wanted to ride races based on that, you know, the way he used to ride about the races, you know, it sounded amazing. And so I just was obsessed, you know. Uh, oh, hi, Joe. <laughs> she popped in. Yeah. I, um, we're burning and I WhatsApped her. <laughs> yeah, did you? Where are you? <laughs> Yeah, so I um, I just, I, I got all 12 of his books and I was just, you know, if I was riding a horse back at home, I, you know, I'm from Oxfordshire, like southwest of England, very country, I'd be pulling my stirrups up and trying to ride short like a jockey. So um, I just had it in my head that that's what I wanted to do. Very disappointing for my parents who hoped I'd go to university. <laughs> Uh, so I went to the racing school in Newmarket, um, I think it was 1992, um, I was accepted on a course and that was like six to eight weeks of boot camp. Um, oh. But it was amazing because the way that they designed the course there was that you were kind of given 
how it would be in an actual racing stable. You were assigned only two horses, but you were looking after them from dawn till dusk. You learned how to brush them properly, muck them out properly, bandage them. Um, and then you were put in a big uh, indoor riding school and you had to learn how to ride short. And then later on, you'd be going up these gallops. So it was really full on. And the horses were extremely full on because they were um, kind of hand-me-downs from racing stables. You could almost see them looking at the fresh meat coming through the doorway. <sighs> <laughs> oh, that's that's fascinating i don't know that we have racing schools like that here in the united states um i know there was one in texas because i remember looking at it a long time ago uh, i think perhaps before i went to the racing school in newmarket there's two in england there's one in the north the northern racing school and there's the british racing school and i think they're fantastic because if you're going to do anything now in racing you must go through that school oh wow. whether you're yeah, whether you're going to be a jockey, uh, when I was doing it, it was to be a jockey. Um, but, you know, whether you're just going to be a stable hand or work towards being assistant trainer or work in the breeding, you've got to go through one of their courses. Um, so you know, I fantastic. noticed in England that they, they um, like I went over and I, I was, um, a, a I, I did a day of in-service education for, is it IVRAP? I, I, I R V A P. I always get it confused. Oh yeah, I've heard um, that. Yeah, and and I think it was in Newmarket at the. Um, they had just finished the museum and everything. It was just beautiful. Um, mm. But the the level of education that I see in the UK and regarding horses that it's formal. I mean, there is educational systems like what you're describing mm. for for working around racehorses, and I just think that that's that's great because then you have a consistent. Uh, mm way of doing things as opposed to you know i mean there's nothing like you know learning it like an apprenticeship but you also need some basic skills and understanding um hmm. so that's really fascinating it, um, oh i agree because there were people on the course who'd never ridden a horse at all and in fact there was one guy called ricky mullins who hadn't ridden a horse at all but he was a natural and he ended up riding in Dubai. He was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, I certainly remember being run off with up the gallop on those horses with, the, and they, the instructors would drive beside you in a Land Rover <laughs> screaming at you to pull the horse's head up. And you know, I mean, it was very old school, um, you know, riding around this indoor arena, riding short, learning how to get your legs strong and the horses, you know, would just drop you and yeah, it was, <laughs> <laughs> Good times. But, yeah, I, um, I bet. We're they really prepare you for an entry into racing. Yeah. 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 So I then, uh, I spent about a year with Paul Coles Yard in Newmar, in, sorry, Lambourne, uh, and then spent some time in Germany. And then I came back and uh, worked in Newmarket for a year with Willie Haggis, uh, and then went to Germany again. Um, but I was already... I was seeing all these riders in Newmarket with their Breeders' Cup jackets and riding out in jeans. And I thought that looks so cool. This is, you know, I really want to go to America. I know I'll ride more horses. Um, and that's what I was told. You go over there, you'll be riding, you won't be doing all the other stuff. So in 95, I wrote to this pre-trainer, this pin hooker in South Carolina and, and flew out. <laughs> and I was like 18 or 19. And that was my sort of, foot in the door to work in the States. Um, I spent some time in South Carolina and met Jamie Woodington, who looked me up and down and went, yeah, spend another year, please, learning how to ride properly, and then you come and work for me on the track, you know? And I was like, okay, okay. So, and then I, I ended up working with her and she was amazing and she got my visa out there and um, I got to, I rode, I actually rode three races at Monmouth Park and four races in Germany. Um, it wasn't for me, but it was fun. Right. <laughs> but it, yeah, so, and that, that was till about 1999. Um, and then I took a break from racing because I had, had to work through some stuff, some personal stuff. And then, um, but I always missed being outside and working with horses. So I, um, after some time working in a corporate and in an office, having a regular job, 
uh, I was looking to travel again and go to New Zealand. So before that, I spent a year, uh, sorry, a season on a stud farm in England um, and did the new market sales. Um, oh no, that was, that was a bit later. I went to New Zealand for a year and then Australia. This was in 2004, 2005, I came back. I then worked the sales um, in England and then I moved over here in 2009, back as a track rider. But this time I really wanted to look at how can I help horses rather than ride them? Because it was starting to, I mean, it was starting to wear a bit thin. And by that, I mean, I got a bit tired of, um, you know, horses. I was just told horses behaved a certain way because of their breeding or because that's the way they were. And, and I was like, there's got to be a reason why they do this. You know, why he, this horse is getting his head up and running through the bit and, you know, how, you know, and, so that's why I started looking at, there must be a pain factor involved. There must be a reason that horses do this. And this was long before I sort of understood that they communicate with us on so many levels. Mm. And, 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 horse and it's not an easy life. You know, I think that uh, for anyone who's never been around a track uh, on the mm. backside, um, they, it's really hard to understand just how demanding it is it's long hours yeah. it's early mornings it's hard work it's you know uh you know who knows where you're living especially in the states you, you know you, you might get some housing yeah. you might not get some housing <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, you might have a room at the end of the barn right and right. um and it's you know it, it and it is uh, 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 kind of a tough life and you know for a jockey and I, I'm really impressed that you actually rode races um, you know the, as they say jockeys are the strongest people on earth they're for their p size pound for pound they're incredibly strong um, but to make weights they have to do crazy things um, you know in terms of yeah. um, diet control and that kind of thing so you know it's not the easiest easiest life um, uh, it's, it's something that, you know, when I was around the thoroughbreds, when I was in Kentucky, I, I looked around and went, that is not my life. Um, that was clear. You know, I yeah. worked the sale, yeah. but um, I had another path. It, <laughs> it is. I mean, it is tough on a lot of level. I, I mean, I love the adrenaline. And, and look, I can say that I've ridden horses that love to go fast. Yes. What was often missed was when things started to go wrong, it then became a problem for the horse. Um, you know, uh, and I just, you know, and I've had some great advice from jockeys as well about, because obviously I'm, I'm about 51 kilos. I can't hold 500 kilos at speed. And Luke Nolan told me once, <laughs> he's a jockey over here. And he said, Emma, it takes two to pull. So, you know, just, so it's more about sort of staying chilled out and calm, but you're going to have those horses that are so, have so many things going on that it's really hard and and just going at speed injuries are bound to happen i mean it's 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 a it's not if it's when um i i also worked for a steeplechase trainer i realized my life was in danger really wow. early on <laughs> um um when uh the they uh, uh, what was his um oh, i can't remember now warrior something warrior and he just come off the track and we went there was a round pen behind the barn, but the manager said, no, just hop on and we're going to go out the front of the barn. Went out, went out the front of the barn and this thing took off <laughs> and yeah. the gate was open. So we're in Kentucky heading down the driveway to the road. Um, and fortunately they hadn't run him over the rolls yet. And I, I aimed him at a four foot fence and I was lucky. <laughs> wow. That was I know, lucky. because they hadn't started jumping him, but you know, um, it, you know, you realize that there's a, uh, there's a certain amount that the adrenaline jock junkies, and I think the steeplechase mm -hmm. are more so than the flat racers. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> the adrenaline yeah. junkies, um, they thrive on that. And you know, the horses are the same way. The ones that really, really love it, they're also adrenaline junkies. They love what they do. Yeah. Um, yeah so uh, well, you know, I think, I suppose what I'd see, what I saw, you know, and then in my time in America and, and in Germany, I had a different set of eyes and a different mindset. You know, I was very much, this is a fast horse, this is a slow horse, this is a good horse, this is a bad horse. It was very black and white. Um, I think I, the horses, I think you discussed this with uh, 
was it Joy, who did the uh, retired racehorse project? Oh, Jen. Uh, Jen. Jen, sorry. And um, you're going to get horses that really are what I would call warriors. And, you know, they're very stoic. And they will, you know, they've got so many things that you wouldn't even know going on, but they're just tough and they give, they just uh, give them their best in every race. And there are other horses where it's so overwhelming for them. And yes, they will look, stop and start to go back. And then they're deemed, they're given a label as not trying, where I think that there's something that's going on that's A, un misunderstood, B, unrecognized, C, undiagnosed. Um, and I think this is where my, my passion is with regards to improving the welfare, welfare and recognition of horses in racing. And you know, what you just said, is, it's true across the board, not just racehorses. And I think that racehorses yeah. right now have a spotlight because in this country, there were a series of uh, incidents that were occurring at a track. I don't, don't know if they yeah, I remember actually that. sorted it out, but you know, it put a spotlight on that industry. Yeah. But the thing is, what you've just pointed out is true across the board in the equine industry. Yeah. And um, it, it comes down to that we have these traditions where we have labeled horses in a certain way because that's the way we've done it. Um, and what we have coming in now, which is, which is part of why these webinars, is education and understanding so that we can say, wait a second, why is this behavior, what is this behavior, why is this behavior occurring, and what do I need to do about it that this horse is trying to tell me? Oh, I agree. I think there's a huge shift uh, in A, what equine welfare is. I mean, I can only really focus on horse racing. I know it's absolutely everywhere. And certainly in my outside clients, I, you know, I've, I've come across some horses that come from horrendous backgrounds, whether it be um, dressage, whether it be raining or whatever. But, I, you know, I'll just focus on racing for the moment. But the, the whole idea of equine welfare is changing. And the idea of, of equine sports, they're becoming aware of, of the importance of having a social license to continue what they're doing mm -hmm. and how yeah, that absolutely. looks in the public. Absolutely. Mm. And, it's, and if we lose that, uh, we lose the industry. And the case in point, when I was um, at yeah. the ISES meeting in Guelph a year ago, um, they talked about the greyhound industry in Australia and how they lost the public favor due to a series of incidents. And um, yeah. You know, once you lose that, 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 you've lost your industry because we require people, race horses require people to support the racing industry through betting, through buy, you know, ownership um, to, to keep the industry growing and going. Um, and at the same time, you know, I think that it's, it's about, it's not about shutting an industry down and locking the door and walking away from it. It's about mm. bringing knowledge and information and education into the system. And then mm. as we were talking about with Jen, the sooner we can recognize this horse is going to make it, this horse doesn't have the heart for it. This horse isn't mm. mature enough. This mm. horse is going to, you know, he just loves it. Then the quicker we mm. can move these horses through the system and get them to the right place. Yeah, I agree, and and but I also because I I um I was looking at a, a, a an action group over here called the TAWWG, which is the Thoroughbred Action Welfare Working Group, and that was set up because of the public focus on um, the ABC documentary here, which was wastage in horse racing, and and so basically racing Mitchell have gone right. Well, let's look at the exit strategy for horses leaving racing. Let's look at the breeding. And they asked for submissions and I missed the submission date because I didn't know anything about it. But I um, emailed them going, listen, I think there's something that's hidden in plain sight here. And that is the welfare of horses in racing. Because if you don't look after them when they're in racing, the chances of them having a great life after racing are limited. Mm, very true. Yeah. So um, an example, I'm sort of just picking bits because we could go on for days about no. this, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I look at a horse like, let's say like black caviar, okay? So I was very lucky to work for Peter Moody when she was around. And, you know, those horses come along like Winx, um, like Cigar, like Zenyatta, you know, they, come, they kind of pop up like an anomaly and they have a constitution and a mental strength that gets them through the rigors of racing. And certainly I met Black Caviar when she was two and a half and she was just like 
I just go fast, that's what I do. By the time she was three and a half, she was able to switch herself off and switch it on to perform. And, you know, really, I saw this maturity happen in this horse. Um, there are many horses that just, they find the thing from weaning to starting to going to the stable, incredibly stressful. The right. pressure is on them and they don't know why, you know, they're, they're not interested in running or winning, but that's what's being asked them to do. There's no consent and there's no choice. So how do we make it better for them so that they all have a chance to prove what they can do? Mm, very true. And it's but, massive. It is massive. That well, one. and I think, you know, so if we look at dogs as a, um, as uh, puppies, as an example, you know, there are breeders and they have a whole system of looking at the temperament of the dogs and they go in and evaluate these puppies and they, you know, the, the growth phase of a puppy from birth to six weeks is like ginormous, um, but they can evaluate them. And I think that it, something like that, I'm not saying that exact system, but this idea of being able to make temperament evaluation, maturity evaluations, as opposed to just strictly like you've worked the sales, it's confirmation, right? It's breeding, yeah. it's black type and confirmation. And even then it was just black type in the eighties when I was there because the industry was going nuts and they were breeding paper to paper and not looking at the horses. So they, yeah. they weren't even looking at the confirmation. And then um, this is one of my favorite stories. I was, I was in Kentucky at the Keeneland sales when the horse sold for $10 million and he was impotent and couldn't run out of a paper bag, but he was <laughs> quickly conformed. You know? And the next year one sold for $13 million and it was the war between Sangster and the mock tomb and they were fighting. Back oh yeah. Right. And then they finally got together and dropped the prices down on the Kentuckians, which was <laughs> to their unhappiness. But um, you know, so you know, we have this where it's, if we could, and I'm just hypothesizing this idea, but starting to look at ways do we, that we can evaluate these horses when they're young to see, you know, are they maturing? Are, are they physically capable? Do they have kind of the traits, which of course have to be honed and have to be trained. And, and just like training a dog, just because mm. you have an innate talent doesn't mean A, you want to express that talent or B, mm that you're developed so that you're your optimum, your most potential. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, I agree. I mean, I, I suppose I look at, I'll look at Peter for an example. I mean, he has a stable of 40 at the moment. Uh, he's the guy I've done the short foot pad examples with that you'll have a look in a minute. Um, he, he has a, a system and, you know, he is a metropolitan trainer. So therefore, you know, the system, they will all go through the same system and he's, he will pick up when they need to go out and if they're not going to make the grade. Um, but still, I feel like there's this time pressure mm -hmm. on, especially in Australian racing. I'm not sure, too sure about American racing. It's been a while now since I was back there. But, um, you know, A, two, they've got to race when they're two. Um, if they start racing late, you know, is that, does that mean it makes them harder to get into a race? There's a, you know, there's just this huge time pressure. I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, they're broken in a year and a half, over four weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Now I have to say, I have come across some very good um, young racehorse starters here, um, not far from where Packenham is. Oh. And they're American oh. based. <laughs> oh, there, Heidi said it's got an eight-year-old mare that's starting soon first up. Well, that's great. I mean, I feel like that should be, you know, people should be allowed to start their horses whenever. Uh, there's huge, but you know, a lot of people, let's say you're a first-time owner, you've come in with a group of friends and yeah, when's this horse going to start? You know, I've been waiting a year. Well, I think you just brought up a really good point is a lot of times the owners are not horse people at all. They yeah, correct. It's like, very easy. Yeah, they like to own a horse, they like to show off to their friends, they like to go to the track, but they're not horse people. And so, it, it, you know, the, the trainer gets put in a bind between the, what the owner expectations are and what the horse needs. Um, and so there's that another education piece of educating owners Correct. to, you know, this, this is a living being. It needs a certain amount of time to mature and develop and be trained. 
Yeah, you, you just highlighted an important issue. And I, I realized that from because I also worked in the office for Peter, um, probably from 2012 to 2014 or whatever. Um, and I track wrote for him. And, you know, there's there's a lot of misinformation that's not given to race horse owners. It's very easy to join a syndicate here. 10%, you probably need about 30,000 to cover your course's cost for the year. Um, but I think what needs to be told to the owners or, or, ed, or information given to them is that this is not, just because you spent, let's say 125,000 sales, you, this horse needs upkeep. And I buy upkeep, I don't just mean feeding and watering and rugging because that's the minimum. Right. That should be the minimum. We're not just doing their feet and their teeth. We're talking body work. We're talking on-site rehabilitation. I think this is where I, I would see, you know, race, racing centers should have an on-site centers of excellence in rehabilitation and veterinary care. And I don't just mean injecting with cortisone. I mean, I want, I want, I would see, you know, um, water treadmills, yep. MRIs, CTs, proper vet workups, you know, that's how it should be. Because certainly I think my example would be in Australian rules football, AFL, if let's say Carlton buy a player for $90,000, they're not just gonna make that guy play a game and then stick him in a room right until the next game right yeah you know they will make sure his diet and his body is looked after and he has proper tr training physiology and it's mixed you know all of this stuff needs to come in and i feel that it, it's missed in a lot of ways i'm not saying across the board but i'm saying um you know you've got a horse that's coming in who's skeletally not mature they're being put around the same track every day they're, you know, they're doing linear work, the same work. <clears throat> they're not getting regular body work. Now, I know it, this isn't the case in a lot of stables. Certainly, Sinead uh, has told me about the great work Rebecca Booth does up in New South Wales. She's fabulous, yep. Yeah. She's going to be a guest but, one of these days under the haranger. <laughs> right. <laughs> Good. But, I mean, that should be across the board. I mean, um, I look at Formula One car racing you know i used to follow that in the 80s when it was really good <laughs> you know like I mean, it was fantastic you had Ayrton and senna and nikki laura and all those guys and i know that mclaren when they built the honda the car that's Ayrton senna one they didn't just fill it up with petrol and change the tires that they did a lot more than that to make sure that car won well and i think that the more we understand sports physiology and we we're looking mm -hmm. at athletes like in america now you know the um, NFL, the concussions were huge and they were hiding yeah. it, right? And they finally acknowledged it and they've made some changes. I don't know if it's enough yet because I don't follow it. But the idea I'm trying to bring about is that we are evolving and changing and becoming more aware and, and recognizing this in, in other athletic endeavors. And it's really important that we, we, not just in racing, but all the way around that we recognize horses as athletes. And the tendency is to yeah. go, it's a horse, it is an athlete, instead of you have to develop this horse as an athlete. Um, yeah. yeah. And that requires making sure if you want peak performance, you have to make sure the teeth, the feet, the back, the saddle, the nutrition, you know, the, the body and the mental work, health, recovery, the mental yeah. health, all yeah. of those things. Um, and, you know, it's even like show horses. There are some horses that thrive on being show horses, and there's some that could care less. Right. And so it's a question of recognizing and then making sure that we we put the right pegs in the right holes, that we put the horses that really want to do those jobs in those jobs. And then we find other jobs for the ones that don't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I certainly know that um, a lot of horses go into polo when they don't make it in racing. But again, that's another high pressure sport. And just because we think that they're not going to be a racehorse, do so they want to be a polo playing horse? But there are um, the polo playing horses that make it love that job because my, yes. my uh, husband played polo and he tells me stories. See. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but again, it's just finding the right niche and it's the same for us. And, mm -hmm. and maybe that's one of the things with COVID that so many of us have been forced out of our routine and our habit to have a moment to reevaluate and decide, you know, is this really the job for me or am I just going through the motions? Because we also have to look at the fact that we do the same thing to ourselves. 
And mm. so, you know, if we're going to change the lives of horses, we also have to recognize that we have to change the lives of humans because the humans express it in their animals, right? And the animals express it back to the humans. And we kind of get into this sort of, you know, married couple thing where it's like, okay, I'm just not going to express my anger. Or I'm not going to express that I hurt, or I'm not going to, you know, I'm just going to go mm. along. But COVID's giving us a chance to say, is this what I really want to do? And, yeah. and so I think it's providing an opportunity and we won't know the extent of the change created by this moment for years, but give it five years after we've kind of gotten out of the panic mode. And I think you're mm. going to start to see that the, the, it was sort of like a fire went through. You guys had a horrible fire when I was down there a year ago, October, mm. but you know, after the fires, the trees grow. And so there's things coming out of the ashes of this event, of this pandemic. Um, oh, yeah. And so, you know, I'm really hopeful that one of the things is that we start recognizing more self-care because we get the opportunity to know what it's like to feel like a horse being stressed all the time when you're constantly going, do you have your mask on? Are you <laughs> contagious? You know, can I walk in that store? No, I can't go in that store. You, know, like, you should see me. I'm kind of a mess sometimes. <laughs> you touched on really important thing and um that's what I, exactly what i was going to talk about i think and that's what led me to start doing the equisoma training with sarah schlota sorry sarah if i've said your last name wrong <laughs> um was that she did a webinar with warwick schiller and she, you know i was you know working and racing again and she mentioned that the animal welfare issue is a human mental health issue mm -hmm. and i was like so here it, it becomes it's you know it's the one one world welfare we're talking about the environment, the animals and us. What affects one affects, you know, and that ties obviously into craniosacral therapy, into any kind of work, the laws of nature, we're interrelated. Yeah. And the mental health and well-being of the people in racing reflects on some of the really bad practices I have observed. Yeah. Uh, that you know, wouldn't I'm surprise just, me at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, that... And so it's, that's when I've gone, oh my God, this is really huge. It's, you know, cause it's all well that I can go, listen, you know, how about we do this? Because I know having worked in racing, I go, you know, I might ride a horse and go, hey, this horse doesn't feel right. Oh, he's always been like that. Hmm. You know, it's, there's this kind of, I'm gonna bury my head in the sand or as I was pointed out a great term, which is cognitive dissonance. Yes. Which is this doubling down on, on what, because you don't want to really look. We, we live in look. cognitive dissonance in my country, okay? You, you can't <laughs> live on this. You can't live on the fence. You yeah. can't live in the place where the two are trying to exist at the same time. It's too crazy making. So you either have to deny or accept. Hmm. At, uh, take global warming in this country. I mean, most of the world has accepted that there is climate change, uh, except for the United States. And the United States has gone into denial of it because you can't live in the place where the two are, it does and doesn't exist. You have to mm. go one way or the other. And that's a lot mm. of physics. So, so yeah, cognitive dissonance is, is really uncomfortable. And it is why so many people stick their head in the sand because, because mm. they are overwhelmed by the consequences of choosing the other path. They are overwhelmed by the consequences of choosing the other path. And what I mean by that is, and, and again, I, I can so clearly remember, and I'm kind of hijacking your talk a little bit, but I was, no, I was go ahead. doing a team demonstration in Lexington, Kentucky, um, after I had met Linda. And I, it was some little expo, and it was in the, in the basketball arena. But I just mm. remember telling them, I had, a, I had a yearling, and I said, if you treat them dumb, they'll act dumb. If you treat the horses like they're dumb, they will give back to you exactly what you expect. And so you know, we have to start having a mind shift about this animal and its behavior toward us and our behavior toward it. Is it simply reflecting me? I'm bashing on it, so it's coming back. Or um, do we have to start looking at why? And the problem with that is that when we start to examine uh, why, we have to examine our belief systems. We yeah. have to examine in the racehorse world or in the, thir in the horse world altogether, you know, this horse isn't a butthead. This horse is trying to show me something in the only way they know how to express that, which is either with their teeth, 
their feet, their anxiety, rearing, bucking, you know, whatever. It's the only way they can show us because they can't say, hey, you know, my saddle's not fitting. And so, yeah, through their behavior, for sure. That's right, through their behavior. And we have to be willing to, to then recognize that everything we've been taught, like, I, you know, I mean, I have a very traditional upbringing in a, in a riding school. Um, I had very good teachers. Um, and my 4-H leader was phenomenal because she was the one that gave me an ethical perspective. But, you know, so often it's like, you just have to make them do it. And we would have Olympic level mm. people come to train our pony club kids. And he would say it was the rider's fault. And he'd still beat the horse over the jump with a lunge whip. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, um, that needs to shift. And uh, you touched to on shift. something which is, which is known as gaslighting, where we, here's an, where we will blame the horse for not adapting to the situation. Right. That is highly stressful. Um, and we, we know generally from some research that horses might take up to 13 seconds to adapt to something new where they need to check it out. Is it safe? You know, for example, um, going in from a light area into the dark wash bay. Yeah. Now I know from experience being on the ground in the racing stable, if I, if no one's around, I can just hang out with that horse and let the horse get used to it and walk in. But, if anyone's around, they will get up behind the horse with a broom. Get up! That now has a strong association with fear, and the horse hasn't been able to adapt. And now the nervous system isn't regulating properly. Correct. You know. Yep. That's and, just one and, example. Um, <laughs> one of the things. So I, I have a, a good friend, Mark Riley, is a DVM up in uh, Massachusetts. And when you walk into his clinic, all the floors are red brick rubber not black because he says that horses see black as a hole oh right yeah and yet what is a wash right. doll a black hole we got a black mat they got to make them go in onto the black mat it's a black hole yeah. the horse is like hey you're putting me in a hole <laughs> yeah correct you know there's there's this whole kind of again that's it's a great i see this as a great opportunity for so much improvement for really um helping people understand how horses think and understand and yes they are mammals just like us they have a vagus nerve they have they are not flight animals we make them flight animals okay they're just like us they like to chill out feel safe know when to move know when not to move i look at horse racing um it's not uh, it's not going to go away so how can we help it develop and evolve and become great you know um everything that's in horse racing goes against what the horse should naturally be doing and I'm talking about a racing stable that's just, you know, like not like the, the guy that you saw that had the horses out in the paddock and brought them into the track. Right. Um, Let me just, just go down in Florida. I've worked with uh, five different race horses with surefoot pads. It was fairly early on, but the barn facility was super peaceful. It was in Florida, yeah. lots of uh, paddocks, horses that were on layup and stuff. They could go out in paddocks. The horses would go out and work at the track. The track was just down, down very close um and it was peaceful you didn't hear yeah. banging buckets or cribbing or any it was very peaceful and you could tell that this trainer understood the importance of making sure those horses felt safe so that they could chill out and rest and then he would not leave them at the track he would trailer them to the track on the day of the race they'd run he'd put them in the trailer and he'd bring them home so that they did not overnight at the track um and it um I worked with five horses and they all won their next race with Surefoot. I'm I know. Sure. When, when Joe told me that, or, or maybe Alex told me that, I was like, oh, okay, I haven't had that experience, but I will. Yes. I will talk about my experience. But, you know, I mean, just quickly to add, when I was in the States, obviously I worked for Jamie. She, you know, how they, they work during the track seasons. And so we go up to the summer for Monmouth Park, which is highly stressful. Um, but she made it a, a good place for the horses as best she could. And, but the winter time we'd be in Camden, South Carolina, mm -hmm. only 40 minutes from Aiken where apparently Dr. Kerry Ridgway was. If only I'd known that when I was 18, um, <laughs> I had no idea. Okay. Okay. Um, it was a beautiful place. So, you know, the, it was, there were probably five barns there. There were trail rides. There was, you know, it was relaxed and the horses got, and there were paddocks. So the horses were just chilled out. Very and I think important. what people need to, to recognize, and I said this the other day, is typically what we hear of is the 10 to 20% that's bad. 
and you don't hear about the 80% that are actually trying really hard to do right by their horses. Um, and like the, like the woman you're mentioning and the person I know that um, are, are aware of that and, and trying their best to provide a good environment and to keep these horses comfortable, safe, and happy so that they do want to perform. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I know there are some uh, new trainers starting up, um, probably Heidi, who's starting up, you know, who have a small number and they, the, the newer trainers, um, especially the female trainers, I'd like to say, uh, are doing smaller numbers and spending more time with their horses. I think that's important. So there is perhaps a question to be raised about whether we reduce the numbers, whether trainers have a, certain, a reduced number. It's not so much a production line. Um, you know, there are some, there are some really bad practices over here that I have seen, but I will also mention I've only been working, you know, in Melbourne and metropolitan area, but, you know, I see a lot of off the track thoroughbreds as clients and they are a mess, psychologically a mess. Post-traumatic stress disorder is not, um, an anomaly in a busy racing stable and, um, Certainly you'll get those horses that have a strong constitution who might be able to just cope, and I say cope, with a highly stressful environment, but many don't. Um, and just to touch on the use of the whip, which I sent you a link about mm, yeah, Mama's really Yeah. Cool. And Racing Victoria are looking to phase that out completely, much to the dismay of many of the racing folk in Victoria, but I see it as a positive um, because I have ridden horses that you know without a whip but they have heard a whip and they completely lose it i have owners that have off the track thoroughbreds that won't let them carry a whip and if they hear a whip they lose it that's post-traumatic stress disorder and that's just one example so you know uh, there's just a lot of information and a lot of I see great opportunity to just develop this, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there and having conversations with you and so many people um, around the fringes, around the edges of the racing industry that are like, yeah, we see what's going on. We can't stop it. Let's improve it. Right. And change starts one hoof at a time. <gasps> yes. One sure foot pad at a time, right? <laughs> yep. So, so, so talk about some of your, because you've been working with Surefoot now, and you also do, uh, tell us some of your other tra training that you have. Um, your cranial safety. Yeah, that, um, it is. I, I probably won't talk as much as I was going to about it, because perhaps we'll do that on the next webinar. <laughs> right. But um, because we want to sort of focus a bit on the Surefoot with racehorses. But I will um, say that it was the racehorse that got me into cranial safety therapy. Um, I went to Equitana in 2010 looking at oh, in Germany. Uh, some oh, modalities. No, uh, yeah. Sorry, I keep forgetting. Uh, and actually the T-Touch. In Australia. Hey? I, I forget that there's Equitana in Australia because I've been to Essen, Germany three times. So. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one in Germany too. Um, yeah, and I, I picked out a few modalities to look at. The T-Touch team were one of them. And Maureen Rogers happened to be doing one on craniosacral therapy at the same time. And, oh, just afterwards. And so I, that just answered all the questions for me. And that was the beginning of my journey into craniosacral therapy. Um, so I, I studied equine craniosacral therapy for a few years. And it was in 2013, as a client, I started receiving biodynamic craniosacral therapy. And that really, the concepts involved in that, um, intrigued me the em embryology the the wider perceptual fields the deeper rhythms the resourcing um i'm sort of just picking out a few key points so that kind of got me intrigued about that and i think i went to london in 2015 to see my family and the cranial sacral trust were doing a weekend intro and so i went and um funnily enough i was actually signed up to do hugh milne's courses um, in Sydney, like a few months later, but he cancelled. And so I was like, oh, well, it looks like I'm going to study with the trust in London. So I had five jobs over the next two years <laughs> and, and paid to get on this course. And, you know, um, yeah, so I, actually during those jobs, I was working for Melbourne Equine Vet Clinic um, and as an assistant sort of mucking out 
job, odd job person. I got to watch John Russell do a lot of surgery on racehorses at the track, which again was fascinating and another form of trauma, you know, organized trauma. But he, yeah, that was a lot of fun. So that was a full on from 2015 to 2017, getting myself to London. And then um, it was a two year course plus a year of anatomy, which I did as well. And uh, here I am, you know, I graduated last year, trained in humans and horses now. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Really awesome. So, so you, uh, I mean, we were supposed to talk about Surefoot and racehorses. So <laughs> yes, yes. So I have got a PowerPoint with some photos. Great. And I can put that up. Oh, so you can share your screen. Hang on. Okay. Done. Okay. I'm going to have a go. And I think I remember what you told me yesterday. Yep, no problem. Here we go. I can walk you through it if you need help. All right, here we go. So I tell you what, Wendy, I'll skip over a bit of the, unless you, would you like me to talk a bit about the embryology of fascia? Because I can. No, we're going to talk about that in the, in the next webinar, because I think that that, yeah. needs, it deserves that, and needs a, a bulk of time. It does. It does. So we'll skip that. And, and Emma, um, I've already figured out we're going to have multiple conversations because we, obviously it's like, we're yakking away, we have gotten to the topic, okay? <laughs> yes, I know. Um, let me just see what this one was. So slideshow from current slide, here we go. No, sorry. I'm just gonna skip over that. That's fascia. This is just a video, this this guy is an off the track racehorse, but I thought I'll put it, I put it on there this morning. Um, this guy's, I think he's 21. Cool. Uh, he he didn't race, but he did go through some, um, it's even when people tell me, oh, they didn't race, and I said, but they were at the track, so that's enough. Enough for things to, to go wrong early on. And, and that's another thing about undiagnosed and unrecognized pain, is that if it's not caught early, later on it becomes something that is even harder to resolve, and you've got secondary and tertiary issues. So the earlier you can get on top of it and recognize pain behavior, and that's a whole other conversation. Um, I, I did Sue Dyson's course through Equitopia on her ethogram, yep. which was fascinating. And I thought it had a real place in, in veterinary uh, assessment of the ridden horse and recognizing pain behaviors in the face relating to I'm muscular- I'm getting her to come on as a webinar guest. Um, I, I'm Great. <laughs> let me shut up and do this okay so I just I zoomed in on this this guy's on the medium pads because I was fascinated with the way he was moving and hoping that Bob Bowker could shed some more light but um, I noticed that when I stand on the pads as a biped my uh, reaction is a lot more prefrontal cortex and how am I balancing than a quadruped who is literally feeling this gentle swaying. Oh, cool. That's great. If you send me set. this video, by the way, like either Dropbox or however, I can, I can play it for Bob and get his feedback. Yeah. Now, this guy, he's, his proprioception is very good. Um, the owner, Steph Bolgi, has given me permission to use this video. Um, he's, he is, uh, how do I stop this? How do I go to the next one? Here we go. Okay, so that horse, his name's Rory. I mean, he has very good proprioception. He stood on the pads and was like, these are wonderful. When I was using them with race horses, I had to really um, use a lot of caution. And I say that because often I didn't know the history and often, the trainer gives me a very blasé history. And, you know, for example, um, oh yeah, this horse had a fractured P3. Here's an example, Joe knows about this. Okay, do you have any x-rays? Oh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you know, it's like, really, and I was just given tiny bits. So it was very much like going, testing, going in, checking, checking the legs. How do they feel when I pick each leg up? Is this horse gonna find pads on his back legs, really difficult, and just working very, very carefully. So um, I use the physio pads a lot with these guys. Yeah. 
that makes sense um, yeah but anyway i just i put this up here because i felt that there's definitely a potential for short foot pads in a racing stable um i use them a lot with matt martin who's peter moody's farrier he's he's really good and he was like these are great you know and he said can you contact wendy and ask her if he's going to design if she'll design something for horses with laminitis that they can wear all the time oh uh, we're working on it <laughs> yeah <laughs> We're working on it. We may have something before the end of the year. That's really good. Yeah. So, um, because what he was using for horse with laminitis were uh, like styrofoam, which is a it's totally breaks, different sense. Yeah, yeah, breaks down different sensory experience altogether. Yep. yep. Um, makes uh, we'll we'll chat afterward, and maybe I can send you some samples. Ooh, great! And I'll send you those videos. Great. Okay. So, um, with regards to using. Then with the race, the challenges I came across with the time factor. Okay, you know, they start at 4.30, they've got to get 40 horses worked, and they want to be done by 8, 8.30. So there's no time to go, hey, can I just chuck the pads on after straight afterwards or before? So I really had to do it at the end of the morning. Um, and I opted to then work with the farrier. Um, because these horses are shod often from the sales, Okay, their, their feet are in contraction from sales. So Matt would come along, take the shoes off, I'll put them on the pads, and he couldn't believe it. He was like, wow, they're falling asleep, you know. <laughs> because it just that sensory feedback was just like, oh, felt good. It's like taking your shoes off and walking on a beach. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, so and was, you bring up a really fabulous point, which is, don't try to stuff it in where it's not where it's not going to work but find the mm. place where it will and working with a farrier who's got to deal with these horses who are maybe a bit foot sore who are you know um uh energetic that if you can make his life better he can do a better job on their feet so it becomes a positive cycle i agree and the farriers uh were really the best sources of feedback for me and i'm not um giving the track riders a hard time it's this that a lot of track riders might not pick up um when a horse isn't feeling right and i had a discussion with my friend steph about this this is interesting is that if you've only been race horses and a horse is bracing his neck and pulling you might think that's just the way the horse goes you're not going to recognize that they're doing that because there's something else going on a lot of riders don't understand um, talk, there's a lot of riders that do understand, but some don't understand the importance of changing diagonals when you're trotting so you can ascertain what's going on behind. Right. And unlike America, where when I was in America, there was a very, they hammered it home the importance of making sure the horse is on the right lead, going around the track. So, you know, we used to break the horses in in America and we had to make sure that you've got to be, it's left handed racing, yep. left lead on the turn, right lead on the straight. So when I came over here and I'm galloping a horse and I said, listen, they changed very late onto that outside leg and they really prefer the inside leg. The trainer wasn't, it wasn't an issue. And I thought, well, this to me is the horse is telling me something. If it's very important that they are transitioning right and that they're balanced. And that's where the um, mixing up their workload is very important. Mm -hmm. Don't just go the same way, do the same stuff and, you know, Expect so, the same um, result. That's the uh, definition. Expect the same result. Yeah, I mean, look, some trainers do a lot of beach work here, and um, some do some arena work, um, which is good. But it's just again, it's really important to make sure if the horse is is only using one side, why, and can we help them balance out? I know that there's often discussions that horses have a preferred side, but to be an athlete, it's very important that you are able to use both sides. Yep. Um, and something that's often missed is that when the horse, and Sue Dyson picks up on this as well, uh, she talks about this a lot, is when you're riding a horse, especially a race horse, you're going to have to start taking contact so that they don't go too fast on a slow morning. And as soon as you do that, the horse then has to adjust his balance to accommodate your contact on his mouth and your balance. Yep. So there's all of that to take into account that make the window for sure foot pads as a post-workout or in between shoeing kind of 
recovery and balance tool quite effective? Perhaps? Yes. And that, and that actually, when mm -hmm. I worked with the resources in Florida, it was after they'd worked, we, we, I, I did one little experiment where I used kinesio tape on a horse and then we took them out to the track. I will tell you back then it was the human kinesio tape because there wasn't any other kind. And right. when the horses sweat, it comes off. <laughs> not designed for fur <laughs> not designed for fur and the exercise jockey was not thrilled with me <laughs> <laughs> you're like hey you know i mean as it starts you, flying off the horse right yeah but you know you were ahead I, of your time you were just waiting for the kinesio tape team to catch up <laughs> exactly oh yeah this is back in uh, this was uh, probably seven years ago yeah okay wow yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, look, I think kinesio tape, all of that stuff, because again, we're going back to them being athletes. Yeah. But um, on the feedback from the farriers, I, I found that to be most useful because often if they are trying to shoe one leg, they'll find the horse will only hold that leg up for so long and they'll struggle. Um, so, uh, you know, what I would do, well, let's put a pad under the leg that they're struggling to balance on. And sure enough, the, the farrier could then put the shoe on. It was like that's great yeah. and 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 i just want to emphasize again finding that little niche is the perfect place because if you if a farrier realizes that this is going to help that horse calm down so he can do his job it's going to start to filter out because he's going to want to take it to the other horses he's working on and so how do we how do we make change one little step at a time you know and i agree yeah and finding the farrier like Matt, who's very open to it. Um, I did use it with another farrier and he was, yeah, he was, thought it was great, but he, again, he just, you know, forgot about it the next day. So it's finding the right person as well. Who's, you know, like, Oh, this is good. I can really use this. Um, I think they're very useful. Those guys, you just ping them again. Every chance. Yeah. You yeah. Yeah. Just ping them again. Some oh, there's that lady with pads. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought about um, obviously, uh, and we put the shoes, the pads on straight after shoeing as well, because there's a huge effect on the fascial system um, of having the nails hammered into the foot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Heidi so, just posted that she barefoot trims her horses, which, right. you know, and and there again, there's different philosophies on that of 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 leaving them barefoot and them just putting a light racing shoe on just before they run, or mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there's a lot of different uh, thoughts on that. Um, and, and, you know, uh, I'm just reading somebody's wanting to know the yeah. situations for racing and the flexibility in the heel, but, um, it, it's about being able to experiment and, and take, take the chance of saying, well, let's see, let's see what happens if, um, yeah. and, you know, hedging your bets, not doing it on the day that it's a really important race, or maybe just doing that at home in practice. Um, mm. but working to see how can, because because shoeing in the racehorse industry is one of the slower changing concepts yeah uh, the the concept of the long toe low heel to increase stride length which has been debunked in every way but sunday um hasn't completely left the industry unfortunately not and i i think that's why we're quite lucky to have matt martin because he very much understands the importance of breakovers and keeping the toe short to enable the horse to break over quicker. Um, certainly one of the horses that you'll see, I'll just, this is Matt. I got him to pose with a short foot pad. Oh, how cool. Um, yeah. And we have a question and it's appropriate right now. She said, uh, Rachel says, I started working with a horse who's very sensitive and snatchy with his hind legs, particularly right hind, mm. uh, right hand, probably right hind. Um, this makes him difficult to trim. Would standing him, uh, standing with her hinds on slants help? Actually, I, I think what would be better is just if you're trimming them is using the physio pad because it's only yeah. half thick. And if yeah. you're on the slants, there's, it's too much instability. It's kind of too demanding. You want to give them a lot of comfort and not make it so that, that if something happens, they're, they're going to lose their balance a little bit. Um, but the physio pad is, I, I have one here. <laughs> oh yeah, there you go. Pad, it's like, it's an inch <laughs> and it creates a lot of comfort and stability and it's got two different foams. So a softer side and a harder side. Um, that, yeah. I mean, the farriers are starting to figure that out in this country and um, they, 
fly off the shelves, which I'm really happy about because it means more horses are oh, going to be. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, we found that using them obviously in between the shoeing. So Matt would take take the fronts off or stand them on the pads, take them off. He'd take the hinds off, stand them on the pads, take them off. Hammer the hammer new shoes on the fronts, stand them on the pads. And often they just really would put their heels on those physio pads. Um, you know, Bob Bowker talks about this: the concussion forces of galloping on, say, a dirt surface, trotting on a road, but also hammering shoe nails into a hoof. Yeah, that's huge. Um, and yeah. Rachel said she has medium pads, but really, Rachel, I highly recommend you get a half physio pad or two half physio pads because the medium yeah. has a lot of springiness, and and yeah. um, I think you're going to find that uh, a lot of horses wouldn't be able to stand on that while they're being trimmed, and that the you want to give them comfort but not challenge their balance, and the medium is actually challenging. Um, so that's we actually designed designed the physio pad. It was originally called the farrier pad. We designed it for farriers. Um, and um, to, to give horses comfort. And we have a master yeah. farrier uh, who called me up. He's had his pad for two years and out of the blue, he called me up and said, it's allowed him to sh shoe more horses that he would never have been able to do because they were uncomfortable, um, arthritic or, you know, horses with things going on. And it's really yeah. made a difference. So, um, so what's yeah, the, um, okay. this, these are this is the treadmill. I, I put these videos in because um, I personally, I'm not a big fan of these. I like the water treadmill, the water spa, the water walker. Um, these uh, have become like a very, a cheap training tool in, in, this is in my opinion. So, you know, the trainer doesn't have to pay for a rider and he doesn't have to pay for a rider to pony the horse. However, my opinion is if the horses like to have a pony to be led off, you know, with no rider, it's kind of nice. Um, Look, most horses get used to this. I'm going to play this one. This is a horse mucking around. Uh, see, he won't, he doesn't want to trot. Wow. I'll play it again, but if you look at this, see how he's bracing against the contact? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So what I've found in body work is that these horses, when they, when they brace against that contact, they get very tight across the top line, very tight across the longissimus. How um, common is it to be using treadmills now? Well, look, I mean, I, I certainly know a lot of people use them at the racetrack I was working at. Um, they often gallop on them, which freaks me out completely. Wow. Yeah. Um, here's a horse trotting quite nicely. And, and they prefer treadmills over uh, like the European walkers because they can actually increase their speed. Um, well, look, they they still use the horse walker. This this treadmill is for horses that um, are having a day off from being ridden, yeah. Or they're just doing. So Peter would probably, um, when he used to have them ponied, like a rider leading them off a pony, he he now uses this, um, which is okay. But I uh, I think if they if they're stressing out on it and they're tightening themselves against that bit, like this guy did here, you can see right. him losing his you know, um, we've, we've got problems. Right. And I think that's what I wanted to talk, see what Bob Bowker says about treadmills. These treadmills, as you can see them on a slight incline. Yep. And this horse um, here, she just was, she trotted for a bit and then she had some slow canter and then she came off. She's quite used to the treadmill. She tends not to kind of pull against it. Uh. No, there is no positive to that gray horse. And, you know, I mean, I, I personally, so I've, I've had a few lameness issues and anytime I've gotten on a treadmill, what I find is it exacerbates that because it's too demanding on my two. I can't, I can't accommodate my issues, right? I'm forced into a certain pattern and um, right. I hate treadmills. Yeah. <laughs> as a result, it's, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I put it on there to kind of go, look, you know, this is what I'm seeing in them. What do other people think? Um, I, I, I would see a, a need for sure foot pads perhaps after them. Um, yeah. it, it depends on how the horse goes on them. A lot of horses really pull against that contact. You can see on that left photo that they're actually, they're tied. Because yeah. obviously we don't not want them. And you know, it's very confining and it is restricting. Um, and when I've watched them canter, 
you know, a horse needs to canter, you know, perhaps with their head down. And again, they're being cantered like they're being ridden in track work, restrained and having to think about their balance and where they are again. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, hang on, how do I get out of this? Uh, you just go to your next slide. Nope, arrow to the uh, left. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. There you go. That, those are Matt's legs there. <laughs> Here we go. So this this horse um, found found it much easier to be uh, shod when she was standing on the physio pad. And so, and you know this brings up a really interesting point because what we find with the physio pad with humans is fascinating. Um, I had a woman who had a head injury from coming off her horse two weeks before I I was there, and I popped her onto the physio pad and her headache instantly went away and she slept really mm -hmm. deeply twice that day. Um, and Robin wow. Hood had a person in South Africa who had a kyphosis and they stood on the pad and they just came totally upright. I mean, it, wow. it, it's a fascinating well, pad. I don't totally understand how it does what it does. I don't think anybody really completely understands it, but it's a magic pad, I swear. It's a <laughs> well, that's going to really tie in well to the sphenoid webinar that we'll do yeah. next month. Yes, because there's a whole connection going up from the feet. Uh, anyway, I won't, I won't go into that just yet. <laughs> so um, I'll just skip. So oh, kyphosis is, um, think of the hunchback of Notre Dame. So anytime the spine curves toward your back, that's a kyphosis. Uh -huh. And anytime it curves toward the, the front of your body, that's a lordosis. So your lower back has a lordosis, your cervicals have a lordosis, and your thoracics have a kyphosis. But um, in some people, it's, it's, normal there's the normal curves and then there's the extremes like like someone with us uh hunchback type um well listen i can certainly say that um actually I haven't got it with me but i've had chronic lower back issues and um, my osteopath the biodynamic osteopath said you need to get some barefoot shoes so i got i always walk in vivo barefoot mm -hmm. uh, unless i'm around horses and obviously i have boots on and i got the very thin soled ones and took this is when I could hardly walk. And I just walked along this gravel road and in about 20 minutes, my back pain went. So it's very important. Um, and I stand on a wobble board every morning as well. And like for five minutes, I don't do anything on it. I just stand on it. And that has helped my pelvis retain its, um, the deep muscle integrity. You're gonna like uh, what Joe is getting. It's the Anywhere saddle chair and it's a saddle shape that you can put on any oh, yeah. chair. Um, and and um, she will have some soon, because she just put out her email. Oh, uh, great. And it's awesome because it keeps your pelvis, like we sit, we're all sitting on these horrible chairs now because of COVID and we're not moving. As <laughs> you can yes. put on, on a, any chair on a mounting block and it's shaped like a saddle, so it opens the hip angle, but you can move the pelvis in any direction and it's, uh, it, it's oh, yeah. a lot of other things, but the difference is you don't need to stand. You don't have to like get rid of your existing chair to use this. You just put it on your existing chair. So yeah, little commercial. Yes. For you, <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this guy is, uh, as you can see, uh, right front, no shoes. The shoes have been taken off. Um, this is how he chose to stand. Um, I think this is. This is the guy with the fractured, the old fractured P3. Let me see. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I remember emailing Joe going, okay, there's this horse. What do you recommend? And then I ended up buying all these short foot pads. <laughs> <clears throat> Here he is. Um, so he's had the shoes on, new shoes put on. They haven't been clenched yet. And that's how he's chosen to stand on them. Oh, cool. Just, yeah. So this horse is interesting to work with. There are some days, this is the one day where he was quite happy to stand on the pads. A lot of times he doesn't want to stand on them because he is in a lot of pain all the time. Yeah. Okay. Like he literally just moved them out of the way and I'm like, that's fine. You don't want them today. That's fine. Um, but it is interesting how they will make their own little slant there and um, mm -hmm. find some comfort in that angle. And that's pretty cool. Very cool. After, just after having them hammered in, they were hammered in literally 30 seconds and then we put the pads on. Yeah. There he is again, there's another angle. So this is a horse, have you used slants with this horse yet? I have, yeah. yeah. I bet he likes them. He does like them actually. Um, 
but then there was uh, another day where I walked in and he said, no, I'd rather just eat them. So, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but he had some, he had a lot of back, some undiagnosed back pain. Um, I tried to point it out. Let's not go there. And it was dismissed. And then they raced him. And of course, you know, he raced very poorly. Um, so again, it sort of comes back to the, if you're not wanting the pad today, what else is going on? He had also um, a reaction to some cortisone that he was given. Um, so yeah, he wasn't very comfortable and he just wasn't up for the pads that day. But yeah, we have used the smarts on him. And, and it, it can be, diag uh, I can't use the word diagnostic, but it can be a very strong sign when you have a horse that really loves the pads and then suddenly kind of goes, eh, I don't want them. And I had Correct. a demo there that, they had moved barns and I'd used her before at the other barn. She was perfect for a video. And then we went to use her and she was like, no. And when the, when the chiropractor came, there was an issue and it was so yeah. clear, no. And then, then she was fine again. Yeah. And again, it's sort of going back to the, the quadrupeds uh, spinal system and the cantilever effect of the head, as opposed to the biped spinal system. If we have a bad back and how that's going to help. Yeah. So, it's very this this is actually um a different barrier this particular horse he he could not uh stand having his left hind shod and he was just having some racing plates on and we put the firm slant under that leg and he shot him but the you know the farrier wasn't helping a hell of a lot he he did have him wide and high yeah um, so that. often you you kind of got to especially if the horse is small you've got to work with their biomechanics as well but this is, it, I, this again proves uh, one point in that, you know, he's clearly showing these horses in their stables on bedding. And yet, Correct. the pads still make a difference. Huge. You know, and that's the thing is we think, well, bedding, it should be comfortable and soft and they should be able to find their balance, but it is no. different in it. And I, and I, you know, eight years later, I'm still going, wow, that's, it still makes a difference um it's very different uh, yeah. i'll actually see the horses will actually if this is without the pads they'll scoop the bedding up so that their heels are supported oh okay yeah. so they want that support you know which and this is just this is shavings um this philly uh this was quite funny i just introduced the farrier to these pads she just had these shoes on and she fell asleep and um I said, we might have to get her off because you've got to do the back ones now. <laughs> she thought they were fabulous. She just was like, oh, nice. This guy, I meant to, I did take a photo of his shoes. Um, it was very blurry and I meant to take another one. This guy, he has three quarter shoes on. Okay. okay. So this part is missing. Now they are used in racing for horses that start to hit behind. Now, yep. um, the issue, of course, isn't them hitting behind. It's coming from the pelvis and the sacrum, which is why they start to plat. Yep. Okay. When they're walking, that's an issue higher up. And that, again, goes back to what we were saying. This needs to be addressed before it becomes chronic rather than try and do it with orthotics. Yep. Yeah. So, yes, the horse is no longer hitting behind, but he is in a lot of pain in his back because of the three-quarter shoes. And because of the excessive weight now being put on this part of the foot. Yeah. So he actually quite liked the um, firm slants being put in this way. Yep. Basically a little bit of pronation. Correct. So what he was doing with this, particularly this time, was he was bringing it forward way under the midline in his, sta in his resting stance. So his whole sacral... Um, integrity had kind of dropped because of the change in his shoes but you know it's again it's the time thing and the lack of information but there's definitely well but you need to do something different to start the conversation right you come in with this funny colored pad and you say i'm going to stick this underneath your horse and your horse is going to chill out and they're like yeah <laughs> yeah they do you know what they actually thought when i when i was talking about them they thought it was um the ther the theraplates they were like oh oh, I, oh. so it, no you don't plug it in or you know turn it on no then how on earth does it work <laughs> so so Heidi I just want to respond to your comment about fixing the symptom and not the cause in mm. some cases we're not able to fix the cause for whatever reason and my example is that I was in Costa Rica and doing retreats and 
we needed more horses than what the, the owner had. And so she leased a horse and his feet were horrendous. I mean, the, the feet were so long and the shoes should have been re removed. The foot should have been trimmed and then reapplied, right? But instead the farrier just showed up and tightened the clinches. And oh. so, you know, this horse was very grumpy and very unhappy. And I would ask him to back away from me because he'd crowd the fence and he'd want to bite me. And so I used him as a surefoot demo and I put him in the round pen, totally free, no halter, nothing. And I just started working with him and I have pictures of him. His name was Oreo yawning like crazy, stacked up on slants on front, really kind of putting him, you know, with heel support and in the angle that his feet were. And after that, I had another retreat because we had back to back and his attitude was completely different mm -hmm. and he was smiley and he'd look at me and he'd work with me and he'd move away when I asked him. And instead of being this horse that was just grumpy, he was trying. And so we couldn't address the problem, but we could change the process and the attitude and made things yeah. better for everybody. So yeah, right. You know, we, and sometimes the solution is, is not a quick, it's a month, six months, you know, some of these things, they're just going to take a lot of time to peel back. But if we keep resetting the system and i think that's that that vagal system you know you're safe you're okay you're okay with me let me do something else with you that i can help you because if the horses are uncomfortable and you got to work with them and they're going to bite your head off you can't help them um, but if the horses recognize that you're listening and here feel this comfort have this pad and they see the pads and they instantly recognize them when you come back believe me um, then yeah. then yeah. we can start to get more into these other things and so um, you know, we don't always have the opportunity to change everything we'd like, but sometimes just making a small change is enough. I'm glad you said that, you know, because I've certainly, on the times when I've done craniosacral on racehorses in training, goodness, there's, there's so many issues. And it's a bit like with the pads. And I heard a great um, quote. It was actually, not a quote, it was an architect told um, one of the, my tutors last weekend. He said, you know, if there's a fence up, don't take it down unless you know why it was put up. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, you're going into a stable with your pads or as a craniosacral therapist, what can I do in this moment that's going to maybe bring a bit more comfort without perhaps undoing a whole load of things that are helping us keep this horse together? Right. And then the owner looks at yeah. you and goes, you, you broke my horse, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know. And then you can't help anyone. And so... You know, we're horses and humans are mammals. And one of the things that we look at with horses is that they compensate, but we fail to recognize that humans compensate all the time because mm -hmm. for the same reason, we, we don't want to appear vulnerable because if we're vulnerable, then s s something might happen to us. If we're vulnerable as a human being, yeah, die. Yeah. if you're vulnerable as a horse, you could die. And so we're reacting out of the same system, but we have this frontal lobe that puts all kinds of weird twists on it. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah right? that frontal lobe. Yeah, but we are, we are coming from the same, same part of the brain, that survival part of the brain that says, don't let on. And, and I can attest to the, the weeks, days, months, and years that I have mm -hmm. compensated and not let on so that people don't see my weakness. Um, oh yeah, we all do it. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. And so to horse, um, so if we take away all their compensations, we might wind up with a really broken horse and the owner's looking at you going, that was my hundred thousand dollar racehorse that is now, you know. <laughs> yeah. So it kind of goes back to just sort of erring on the side of caution. I don't know the full story. Let's just, and certainly if I'm doing a craniosacral session on a horse in a stable while I'm dealing with a horse that's in confinement, they're not got that big horizon and that herd. So I'm just going to hold their system as a whole and just, you know, let the horse feel whole again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sometimes that's the most important thing is just acknowledging that hmm. they're there. Yeah. Now I just going to show a few clips of a lot of horses just wanted to do this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now I find that off locking that hind leg because race horses, often their pelvis is never looked at. But we've got those deep structures like the obturator group. Yep. We've got the the sacrum and the pelvis starts to change angle when they when they're often in that linear work, which is very unfortunate. You off lock that leg, 
with something that's kind of got a nice soft structure, but a stable structure, it feels good. And, and it's surprising, like people will, when I've worked with horses with surefoot and the horse just rests the toe like this, they think that nothing's happening. And yet the, so much can be happening. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look at this guy. This guy, um, he's this particular horse. I remember when I first went to see him with the pads, I introduced him to the pads in the front and he stood on them. But what was interesting is he stood on them, but didn't rest. He had checked out which was a big warning sign that he was really dissociated. So I took him off until he started to come a little bit more present over the time and could make a choice. He just stood on them and was just not there. Yeah. Um, so this has been over a period of weeks that I've sort of come in and out with this particular horse and his hind end was so unstable, he couldn't even stand on one, let alone two pads. So this is what he likes to do really off lock the leg look at that softness there i can almost feel the fluid in the yep. fascia just moving up the leg and all the way up into the low back mm -hmm. even though you can't see it yeah even though yeah obviously for you know i trying not to show the horses yeah no i i totally get it yeah. but you can you can see the chain you can see the line going up into the low back i can yeah yeah and we got to remember that that um the body is fluid and fluid is movement and movement is life. And so if they can just, you know, these guys are standing around for 22 hours. If they can just do something slightly different, yeah. oh, that feels good. And this is Rory again. Wow. <laughs> now he just had a trim and I wanted to show this photo. This is the soft pad because um, I love how he just loved the feeling of that white line sinking into that. Yeah. Um, surface now i i my feeling is is that there's a huge amount of feedback going in it feels good yes and again you know people look at you know, oh he's just resting his toe but no there's so much more going on there because the the hoof has um dr bowker talks about um textures and feeling in the in the sole of the foot and so yeah. we we tend to think of it as a hard case, but really it's alive. And there's so much, oh, yeah. uh, so many proprioceptors, you know, mechanoreceptors, things happening there that you, you just, you know, I always say the, the horses know what they need. We just have to kind of use the pads to figure out what they, what they need and they will show us. It's really and that's what I love about them. It's the listening and the choice, which what was funny is when I, I said to the racehorse trainer, I said, well, it's because the horse stepped off the pads one day and I said, he went on and put him back on. I said, well, no, he's had enough. He's, it's about his choice. And honestly, he thought I had three heads. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Stephanie just said that that's the foot he blew an abscess on in the lateral heel. Ah, hi, Steph. Great. This, this is his owner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Well, Steph's been uh, fantastic letting me share these photos with Rory. Great. Um, and look, obviously, I won't delve too much into embryology. We'll talk about that next webinar. But you know, fascia comes in in the middle layer of the embryo, but the embryo uses the neural crest cells as well as fascia. So the neural crest cells are on the ectoderm, which is the outside, which forms the skin and the hoof and the brain. So absolutely, we've got intelligence right at that hoof tip there, yep. all the way up to the top of the ear. Yeah. I've seen horses change their, um, movement in their pole in their atlanta occipital junction from resting one hind leg on a physio pad oh how cool <laughs> yeah it was good i because i watched him he stood just he only wanted one leg he stood on it the rider got back on and he immediately had a figure eight movement and an opening up of the atlanta occipital junction very cool. And, uh, and I love that what you said there is just one pad because so many people think, oh, I've got to get my horse on more and more and more pads. And it's really sometimes just, just one foot, one pad is what really is the key. You know, it's the magic. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That's trauma. We yeah. can talk a bit about that, but that's, I have got some other videos, but I need to find them in my file. Well, we are at 8.30. We are. We at are. So, <laughs> I, um, I think this is probably maybe a good place to stop. And if you unshare your screen, I just want to show yes. a picture of Mr. Watanabe. Um, 
which I have here. So um, I, 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 oh yeah, yeah, I've done a little bit that. with racehorses. So um, back in the beginning, uh, I was able to go to Florida, work with a, a very good racehorse trainer and his mm -hmm. wife, who's a veterinarian. And so we worked with five different racehorses uh, using Surefoot pads. And the thing about that, it was after they'd worked out in the morning, it was in the afternoon in the shed row, um, and we'd bring mm -hmm. them out. And, you know, some of these horses were really pumped up, even though they had already, you know, exercised that day. So working with them, it's, it's sometimes it can be a challenge. Like, you, mm. you barely have them on a pad and you got to move them. <laughs> you got to let them yeah. move. Um, yeah. but Mr. Watanabe was an exception. And in his very first session, this horse so got it. He stood on four pods and he's one of the <laughs> few horses that I've had stand on four pods. But the trainer told me that he just ran out of gas. And what I noticed was that he had a habit of shortening his neck. So, mm -hmm. so I put him on the pads and I could see that he was shortening his neck. So I taught the trainer just how to gently lengthen the horse's neck. And so when he went to the track, um, he just gently lengthened his neck and this horse won his next race. Right. Huge. Yeah. He's huge. And sometimes yeah. it's like what he showed us was how incredibly balanced he already was. I mean, mm. it's very few horses in ones that, in fact, it's less than a handful that have stood on four pods. And I would love to know where this horse is now because the, he had such sort of amazing balance. But, you know, it, it, it leads us sometimes to look for other things. And the other thing was, wow, look at how he's shortening. And so maybe when he's running, he's shortening. And so he's just not getting the stride. I'm not sure. Mm. I understand. Oh, that's because you shouldn't be talking, Siri. <laughs> <laughs> Did she have a question? <laughs> uh, I, I know that, um, that was at Tampa Bay Downs, that photo. Oh my God. I, I dragged my parents and my brothers and sisters there before. <laughs> When we went to Florida on a holiday and because I was so obsessed with horse racing, I'm like, we have to go. And of course they all like, they went along, you know, but I was just, oh my God, this is where I have to be. <laughs> you know, and it, it, it is interesting how, you know, we are drawn to things in our life and not always for the reason that we think, right? We're maybe mm -hmm. not there for the reason that the purpose that we think or the reason that we think, because, you know, I mean, I was going to be a tough event rider, and then within two months of that decision, a horse flipped on top of me and broke my hip socket. So <laughs> nasty. I remember you talking about that. It's not good. I had a racehorse flip over on me in 2017, just when I was trying to save up to do this course. Sorry, 2016. And um, I just, I had to, because I had no, no other jobs I could do, I had to like mentally get myself back into it. It was so full on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, but yeah. now look at the, from your experience and, for, and that's what my, kind of my takeaway is that it's these experiences with the desire that we have, like I'm still with horses, right? People thought I was nuts. They thought I'd never ride again. Um, but from our experiences, we can create uh, change. We can create yes. uh, something in the world that brings forward new ideas out of those ashes. And I think that that's what's so important that even in the racing industry where we know that things are much less than perfect, there's still an opportunity to bring forward change and to start wherever you can, um, whether that's with yeah. the carrier, whether that's with one, you know, one horse, one place and plant the seeds that will grow. They will grow. Yes. Or, or send lots of um, papers to the action groups, which is what I've been doing. <laughs> but it's important that we give the horses a voice. I know a lot of people say that, but um, a lot of people don't forget that when you look into a horse's eye, there's somebody's home, you know, there's somebody there. There's a, an intelligent being there, you know, that has a vagus nerve and a central nervous system, you know. Yeah, just like us. And that's... And, and needs respect. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's a it. very important point that, you know, it, it makes me a little crazy when people go, well, your horse, you, your horse has to respect you. Well, Respect is a two-way street and it has Correct. to start with me, right? Yeah. I can't get respect from another living being unless I give respect. And mm -hmm. I think that that's what people sometimes miss is the importance of putting it out there for it to come back. Absolutely. Fantastic. Well, okay. Emma, this Thank has you. been, I, I can see that we can chat forever. Um, really? So, <laughs> 
<laughs> we're going to schedule you to come back for another webinar because I'm, I'm so curious about the whole embryo thing because embryology was one of my favorite mm. courses. And I always talk about blastomeres and tubes and sphincters. Yeah, and, and I'll be bringing out these little babies, the hyoid, the, the sphenoid, and awesome. we'll talk all about that. Um, and, and so Thank we're you, scheduled back fairly soon, I think. And, um, uh, it's great. It's, that's the beauty of, of zoom and COVID is that we can have these conversations around the world. And, um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you with you tonight. Oh, likewise. Thank you so much for asking me. Thank you very much everyone as well. All right. So thanks everybody for tuning in. Just remember you can see this and all the other webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. And we're creating audio podcasts out of the, some of the webinars. Um, it's on Podbean. It's Wendy Murdoch on Podbean. And I also, we post them up on Facebook. So just be sure to subscribe to the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel so you get notified every time we put up a video. Thanks for joining us tonight. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye. Bye.